And we're going to start by talking about um, providing information to your child so that your child knows what the expectations are, what you want them to do. We're going to talk about ways to motivate your child. And we're also going to talk then about some specific teaching strategies to help teach your child. But first, let's start with the informing aspect. So if you were with us yesterday, we did talk about the use of visual support strategies a bit. So some of what we talked about yesterday will apply as well today. Um, and I am going to talk a little bit about visual support strategies, but not in a great deal of depth. So if you are interested in learning more about visual support strategies, um, Autism Videos at ACT has a visual support strategies workshop that I did for them that is available for you for free. So you can access that there as well to get more ideas in terms of visual support strategies. But just to give some general thought to this, what we want to do first is make sure that we're providing information to children so that they know what it is that the expectations are, what it is that you want them to do. So you'll want to use things like calendars, visual schedules, checklists, things like that to provide information and structure to your child. So some of the skills that you were thinking about this morning, some of the targets that you might want to focus on with your child had to do with things like organizing, knowing what happens first, second, third, making preparations, um, engaging in time management, some of those kinds of things. And that's where this comes in, right? So using things that we all use, calendars, schedules, checklists, to make plans and organize our time and really sort of think about, you know, what needs to get done first, what can wait until later, how we're going to make those plans. So lots of different kinds of visual supports that we can use to provide some of that activity-specific information. So you might be thinking about calendars as a way of showing um, either weekly or monthly tasks that need to be done and when those things should occur. So if you think about things like laundry day, shopping day, vacuuming day, you could get a great big um, desk pad calendar. We talked about this yesterday. If you go down to the office store, you can get one of those great big paper desk pad calendars and you can either write down the information if your child reads, or if you're using symbols, you could um, print out a bunch of symbols and sort of cut and paste and do that with your child. Let's sit down and plan. When are we going to do laundry? When are we going to vacuum? When are we going to do these different things that we need to do? And maybe you have a set day every week. Maybe it varies from one week to the next. However you decide to do it is completely fine. But your monthly schedule, your monthly calendar can show that information about when we need to plan different activities. You can also use visual schedules to show that breakdown from you know, morning to afternoon into evening of what it is that needs to happen. And this is a way of providing structure to the day. And we talked yesterday about those between activity schedules, the kinds of schedules that take you from, you know, get ready for school, have your breakfast, go to school, um, maybe do your homework, play with toys, clean up, eat dinner, those kinds of things. So you can have those kinds of schedules. You can also have schedules that take a single task and break it down into smaller pieces. What you see on your screen is just an example that sort of takes that morning time and breaks it down. You've got your morning routine of doing your hair and your teeth and whatnot, then having breakfast, then packing your bag, and then going to school. And you see in the example that I've made, I've got clocks placed in there as well so that you can draw in the actual times to show your child what time things are supposed to happen. Yesterday, I told a story about the use of these kinds of clocks, analog clocks, um, as a way of helping kids know what time it is when they should be transitioning and how it's not necessary for kids to know how to tell time. What they need to be able to do is recognize that the time that's shown on their schedule on that clock is similar to the time on an actual clock. And the reason that I recommend analog clocks rather than digital is because with digital, you have only 59 seconds for your child to make the match. So if the time is 8 o'clock, and that's when they're supposed to transition, and it says 8.00 on their schedule, and they're looking at a digital clock, there's only 59 seconds where that digital clock also says 8.00, and very soon it will say 8.01. And if your child doesn't know how to tell time, then they don't know that 8.01 is after 8 o'clock, and so they should be doing whatever they should be doing. 
Whereas if you use an analog clock, there's just slight movement sort of between say 759, 801, and the difference is very slight. So it's often easier for kids who need a bit more time to have that time to kind of look at the two and go, oh, okay, they're the same. So that's why I recommend using analog clocks. Here's an example of a visual schedule that I made for a child I was supporting um, during a morning routine. And this was a child, he was seven, diagnosed with autism. Um, he was very bright, uh, intellectually gifted as well, great language skills, um, but completely not independent in getting ready for the morning. And his mom essentially sort of guided him physically through all the morning tasks and did them all for him. Um, and he just kind of like relaxed while she brushed his teeth and she dressed him and she did all these things. And so I came in and developed a positive behavior support plan to address this morning time routine and taught mom to use it. One of the things that we created was a visual schedule to show him what he needed to do. And as we talked about yesterday, we talked about, you know, embedding child's preferences and interests into our activities and into our supports. And that's one of the things that I did here. This was a child who was really interested in transportation. And so when I made his visual schedule, this was a big poster board for his wall. And as you can see, we've got the sky above all of the different images of tasks that he needs to do. And there's a roadway and there are railway tracks. And so it goes with the theme of transportation. And rather than his schedule being where he takes off symbols and turns them over or something, instead in the mornings he would choose a vehicle to represent where he was at in his schedule. And so we had a number of um, vehicles that go in the air. He had planes and rockets and hot air balloons. He had a variety of cars and trucks and bicycles and motorcycles that went on the road. And then he also had different kinds of train cars. Um, he really enjoyed trains. So he could choose a particular transportation item and then he would move his transportation item along the schedule to show where he was at. And so again, a way to sort of um, take advantage of his interests and use that as a way to motivate him to follow his schedule. But we provided a very explicit schedule for him around expectations and what needed to happen, okay? So that's what we mean when we think about a visual schedule. Take the tasks that you want your child to do and list them all down and then create some visuals so that your child knows what those tasks are. And we're gonna talk a little bit later this afternoon about where you can go to get some of these images and, and how to start making visuals. You can also look at checklists, um, which can be to some degree kind of like a mini schedule. We talked about those yesterday as well, where you can take one activity, break it down into the component steps and then create a schedule for each step in one activity. So you see um, with getting dressed, for example, take off your pajamas, put on your underwear, put on your pants, so on and so forth. Those are the individual steps for one activity. You can also look at something like your morning routine as a single activity and then break that down further. You need to get dressed, you need to brush your teeth, you need to wash your face. And so you can make these kinds of visual checklists um, laminate them and your child could use a dry erase pen to check off where they're at or they could um, have symbols that they rip off and put in an envelope. So there are lots of different ways that children could show where they're at in their schedule um, but essentially it's about breaking things down into those individual steps. We talked a bit yesterday about creating these kinds of things. This is essentially a task analysis. We're taking one task and we're breaking it down into the individual steps. So what I always recommend people do, because as adults, we kind of do a lot of these things by autopilot. We don't really think about what we're doing when we're getting dressed. We just get dressed because we've been doing it for so long. And so sometimes we forget all of the steps that we need to do. So what I recommend that people do when they're creating a task list like this is go ahead and write down what you think all the steps are and then actually do the task following the steps as you have written them down. And that's gonna help you identify if you've skipped over anything or missed an important step. Because if you don't include the step, your child isn't going to do it, okay? 
So these are some examples of checklists. This is also one, and I know this isn't in your handouts, but you can cope. Um, this is an example of a showering support that I made for an adult woman that I was consulting with uh, several years ago. And she wasn't independent in showering. She also was somewhat resistant around bathing or showering. And so this was part of a positive behavior support plan designed to address that. Um, and we started in the bath because it was safer. But then once she was um, not engaging in problematic behaviors around bathing, we started to move her into showering because she was an adult um, and she actually wanted to have a shower rather than a bath. And so this is a laminated checklist of all the body parts that she needs to wash in order. And the way that I um, set this up, because we don't want a whole bunch of little symbols in the shower kind of floating around in the water, um, I cut little tags. So essentially, if you look at the images here, so you see this rinse hair and body image at the top, and there's like a little flap over here. So when I um, made the visual support, I laminated the whole board, and then I cut out the tabs with space in between. I put a little extra packing tape around them to keep the water from getting to them. And I also found online, not the best Velcro ever, but it worked well enough. Um, right over top of all of these images, there are clear Velcro dots. So you actually can't see the Velcro, but it's there. And when she folded over the tabs, then the Velcro held it closed. So it was a way of her knowing where she was at because she would forget where she was at. So she would do one step, close the tab, do the next step, close the tab. And so you see in the picture on the right, some of those tabs are closed to give you an idea of how that works. So you can do things like that as well, okay? So if you're thinking about checklists, again, right, do a task analysis. Write down all of the things that you think need to be done in the correct order that they need to be done. And then go back and double check, right? So you can either just sit down and write your list or you can do the task and write as you go along. Either way, I always say go back and do it again just to make sure, or give your task list to someone else, to another adult, um, to someone who can do the task independently and have them go through your checklist and make sure that everything is there. Because again, for a lot of these kinds of activities that we do lots of you know, day to day, we don't really think a whole lot about it anymore, so it's really easy for us to forget things that don't seem like they're really critical. But if you don't know how to do the task independently, there are critical steps. And if you forget it, right, it's a problem. So do that kind of a thing first to make sure that you have all of the steps down in exactly the correct order before you spend time making anything. Once you've confirmed that you've got the steps all in order, everything is correct, then you can go ahead and create a, a checklist for your child in any form that's appropriate. So it could be just written. If your child is able to read that and understand it, great. If not, you can use pictures with text as well. And again, we'll talk about some sources where you can access pictures later. We can also look at visual supports for specific activities, right? Any activity you can make visual supports for. And again, if you're looking for ideas about visual supports, check out the visual support strategy uh, workshop at uh, Autism Videos at ACT. But we'll talk about and I'll show you some examples of a few. For any activity, you really need to stop and think to yourself, what are my child's needs around information, what it is that they're supposed to do, um, and direction or instructions? Like, how much support does my child need? And if you think about it in terms of, you know, independence, certainly if a child still needs to look at a visual support to tell them what to do, they're not independent in the sense that they're remembering all of the steps on their own. But if they know how to do that task and follow the instructions on paper and they don't need another person showing them, from a functional standpoint, they're independent, right? I can make cookies. I've made cookies lots of times, but I can't make cookies without a recipe. Does that mean I can't make cookies independently? I wouldn't say so, right? I can make cookies independently, but I do need a recipe to refer to or I'll forget something important, right? And so this is really what we want to think about with these kinds of visual supports. Think about creating visual supports that will enable your child to complete a task independently without another person supporting them at the end of the day. 
If they still need to take their visuals with them, that's fine, right? But they can still do the task without any extra help. Excellent, okay? Um, so think about things that might support your child's development of independence or might support just their engagement initially. So they might not be independent at first, but it's a way of getting them a bit more engaged in the activity. And then over time, you can start to fade yourself out. And we're going to talk about ways of fading yourself out later. So for those of you who are thinking, I have to do everything with my kid. How do I ever get to the point where I don't have to? We're coming to that. But let's first look at some things like visual recipes, visual organizers, and other kinds of task-related visual supports that you can use to help teach some of the skills you want to teach to your child. So first, let's think about visual recipes. Um, there are lots of recipes out there, and I'm going to give you a couple sources of places where you can get recipes that have been made. But you can also make these as well. Um, this is actually an example of a recipe that I made for one of my clients. This was during the pandemic, um, and I was seeing this client virtually. He's a young adult. We're working on some independent skills. And um, so we were doing, and this is a bit of a stretch, we were doing virtual cooking. Um, and so mom or dad would be with him um, in his home, kind of providing hands-on support because he's not able to be entirely independent in the kitchen yet. Uh, but I made a visual recipe like this, and I would have multiple devices in my kitchen at home. So I'd have one where I was Zooming with him, and then I would have the other screen where I was projecting a recipe for him, and so he could see everything. And so what I made in terms of a recipe for him, thinking about what his needs were, was first a get everything page. So he's got a page where it sort of lists out and shows him all of the different materials that he needs to get. Okay, And so most of these symbols come from the Boardmaker software program. These are called picture communication symbols. These are not called PECs, so I'm going to take this moment right now um, just to do a little aside. So these are not called PECs. PECs is an actual program of instruction where we use symbols and a specific instructional program to teach individuals to exchange symbols for communication purposes. These are called picture communication symbols. They're a specific brand name for symbols, and they come from some software called Boardmaker. We're going to talk about Boardmaker and where to get Boardmaker in a bit, but that's where these symbols come from, except for the Aunt Jemima box down here, which came from Google, right? Which is, again, the nice part about having Google. When I was starting making visual supports about 30 years ago, we didn't have a Google, um, and we didn't have a lot of decent online images. So there was a lot of either hand drawing or taking photos and scanning photos, because this was even before we had you know, digital cameras at the ready everywhere, too. So I had to get creative in the early days. So once we've got all our materials, then we would get to the cooking part. And so washing hands first, always the first thing that I put in any recipe, because it's really important. I've cooked with kids long enough to know what's on their hands before we cook if we don't wash first. Um, and then we have the recipe. So I just went to the Aunt Jemima box, took the recipe, and sort of translated that down into steps that would be um, clear for him. Okay, so two cups of pancake mix in the bowl, a cup and a half of water, so on and so forth. Um, and you can see we get to the point where he plugs in his waffle machine, sprays it with some Pam. And uh, over here, you actually see the waffle machine he had. Um, he's got an interest in all things Disney at the moment. So he actually has a Mickey Mouse waffle maker. And so that's what he used to make his waffles. So you see now we've got several kind of repeated steps of once the waffle is done, you're going to take that waffle off and put it on a plate, and then you're going to make another one, right? Because usually you're not just making one waffle, you're making a batch of waffles. And so we went through that whole process and then sat down and ate. So that's an example of a visual recipe that you can make, so you can individualize things. If you're thinking about starting cooking and the idea of cooking with anything hot is a bit scary, Maybe you start with no-bake kinds of things. So maybe jello pudding, or maybe some no-bake cookies, or maybe toast, right? So do simple things, right? And then as individuals develop some of those safety skills and the awareness of you know, where you have to be safe and how to be careful, and you're feeling comfortable about 
trying some of those things, right? Where you kind of feel like you have enough control um, of your child in the kitchen that you're pretty confident nobody's gonna get hurt, then go ahead and move on to sort of more advanced things. If you're looking for sources for recipes that are free, I've got two links in your handouts for you and they have excellent um, examples of recipes that are really clearly broken down and they're designed specifically for individuals with developmental disabilities um, and lots of variations in terms of the kinds of foods, meals, snacks, breakfast, lunch, dinner, the whole kind of uh, range. So take a look at those if you're looking for some recipes and don't want to spend a bunch of time making your own. Somebody has done a lot of work for you already. Um, in terms of other kinds of visual supports that you might use as you're working on building some skills, one has to do with location supports. And we talked about this yesterday, environmental supports. Supports that essentially tell the individual where to put things. So when we were brainstorming skills earlier this morning and brainstorming the kinds of things that you might focus on, quite regularly it came up. Where to put things away, how to organize materials, where to access materials. And so these kinds of visual supports are perfect for helping to develop those kinds of skills, okay? Over time, you might fade these supports away, right? Once your child or young adult knows where to find things, things stay in the same place, they don't move, you can start to fade those things away and your child remembers. There are other individuals that I work with who have more significant intellectual impairments, they might not remember. Right? I work with some individuals who have seizure disorders, and sometimes people with seizure disorders, after seizures, they forget where things are, and so they might not always remember. And so for those individuals, we might leave the visual supports up. It doesn't really matter, um, and you can make them look nice. They don't have to like look, make your place look bad. You can sort of design them in a way that they look pleasant. Um, but you can essentially label dresser drawers, um, cupboards, cleaning areas, whatever it is that you need to label to help people know where they can find things and where they should put things away, okay? You can use visual supports to help organize tasks. So many people, I was happy to see, there is laundry sorting happening out there somewhere in the world. Um, so you can use visuals to help individuals learn about sorting laundry. So you see I've got two laundry baskets on your screen and one is labeled with white clothes and the other is labeled with colored clothes. And so you can use that as a way to help individuals know how they're supposed to sort and then work on those matching skills, essentially pick up a piece of clothing and determine where does it go. If you're sorting your clothing based on types of material, you could actually get fabric swatches and cut out fabric swatches so that they've got an actual swatch of fabric to match to. That's certainly something you could do as well. So you can get as creative as you want about this and essentially make whatever you need to make that will provide information to your child in a way that makes sense, okay? Lots of people mention table setting and table setting is a great place to start, right? Even if it's just cutlery and napkins, the non-breakable things, right? If you're concerned, maybe you've got little ones or you've got older individuals who aren't very careful yet or maybe not aware of glass, and you don't want to have them walking around with glass things, start with fork, spoon, knife, napkin. And you can make placemats that essentially have the outline of everything and what belongs where. So this is a simple matching skill. So if you have a preschooler, um, as long as they can pick up a utensil and you know get up on a chair, or if you've got a stool, they can see the placemat, they can work on basic matching skills at the same time as they're helping to set the table. So those kinds of visual supports can help. This can also be really informal. Um, so I made this image because it was easier to make it than try to take a photo. Um, but imagine that you've got an individual you're teaching to dust and you want them to know all of the places that they need to dust. You could take a pad of sticky notes and place a sticky note on all of the things that need dusting and that's where they dust. If you're thinking about you know, starting dusting with somebody and maybe dusting isn't their idea of a great time, it's not really the idea of a lot of people, it's a great time, right? Um, Maybe you just put one sticky note on one thing and then they're done. 
And then after a while, you put out two sticky notes and they dust two things and then they're done. And then you put out three sticky notes. They dust three things and then they're done. And so on and so on and so on, right? So you can do something really inexpensively and really informally in terms of providing information around expectations, okay? If you're going grocery shopping, you can make grocery shopping lists that essentially show what it is that you need to get. We talked yesterday about labeling the fridge with food that's in the fridge and putting symbols on your fridge, putting symbols on your cupboards. And you can certainly do that. And at the same time, you could have on your fridge a laminated page with bits of Velcro on it where when the milk is gone, you take the milk symbol off the fridge and put it on the shopping list so that as you use things, it goes onto the shopping list. So now your child is learning how to manage what food is in the house and what food is gone. And when things are gone, it goes on the list. And then when it's shopping day, we take the whole list and off we go. Um, I've made a shopping list for a few different individuals I support where I just laminate a big sheet and I've got some Velcro on it. And I make a couple of Velcro loops so that we can actually attach it to the grocery cart, whether it's on the side and lower down if I'm supporting a family with a little kid or up higher on the handles if I'm supporting a young adult. Um, and then typically what I'll have is a little envelope where as we buy things or put things in the cart, we can take the symbol off and put the symbol in the envelope. Um, sometimes I'll just attach a Ziploc to the back of the shopping list and we can put symbols there. So doing whatever it is that's gonna work best for you, um, but providing a way again for your individual, whether it's a child, a youth, a young adult, um, to participate in this. We talked earlier today in terms of skills that could be developed. Lots of you gave you know, counting and, and those kinds of math skills. So putting in the number, right? Five apples, we need five bananas um, so that you can do counting. Somebody else talked about um, teaching the skill of how to determine if the apple is a good apple or a bad apple, right? And how do you look at it and know whether or not it's like bruised and gross and you don't wanna buy that one or if no, this one looks pretty good, we'll take this one. Um, so looking at those kinds of things that you could teach. Um, getting eggs or milk, checking the expiry date before you put it into the cart. If you're getting eggs, popping the top and looking to see that all of the eggs are okay and none of them are cracked before you put it in your cart. So all of those kinds of skills you can teach. And if you need to put a check the eggs in, you can put that check the eggs right onto your grocery list, okay? So lots of different ways that you can inform. But inform is really where we wanna start. We wanna make sure that um, whether it's a child, a youth, an adult, that we're trying to teach, that we're giving them clear information about what the expectations are. What is it that we want them to do? How do we want them to do it? Um, how are they gonna know that it's over? So really thinking about for your individual child, what is it that my child needs in terms of information in order to be successful, okay? And that's the information that you wanna provide. Is it likely that sometimes you make something and you think that you've provided enough information and then you get out there and try it and you find out it flops? I've been there, it still happens to me, right? I'm 30 years into visuals and it still happens. And so when that happens, it's okay, right? I carry around a lot of Sharpies and dry erase pens with me so that I can mark up stuff that's laminated. Um, and I also just go back to the drawing board and make something new, right? I save everything I make and I go back and then I can adjust as I need, right? So if you don't get it right the first time, that's fine. You learn from it and you go back and you make some adjustments and then you carry on, all right?